Our scripture reading for today comes from Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 through 37. You have heard it that it was said to the men of old, You shall not kill, and whoever kills shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother shall be liable to the council, and whoever says, you fool, shall be liable to the hell of fire. So if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Make friends quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court, lest you, uh, your accuser hand you over to the judge, and the judge to the guard, and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out till you have paid the last penny. You have heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your eye, right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and throw it away. It is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that anyone and everyone who divorces his wife, except on the grounds of unchastity, makes her an adulteress, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard that it was said to the men of old, You shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, Do not swear at all, either by heaven, for that is the throne of God or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no, any more than this comes from evil. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious, most wonderful God, I give you thanks for this Sermon on the Mount. And yes, I give you thanks for even these very difficult passages. So may these words of my mouth and may the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable unto you, I ask. In the name of your Son, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Yeah, not what you necessarily want to get up and hear first thing on a Sunday morning. I'm sure I can make the assumption, and I know what happens when I make assumptions, that there is not a person in this room that has gotten angry at least once in their lifetime and done something they have regretted. Yeah? Yes. Okay. Okay. But when we hear this passage, do you hear Jesus comparing murder with anger? And that can make any person of faith just a little bit nervous. Especially those of us in our cultural world who think we have to be perfect in everything we do. I believe we tend to avoid this text as it seems almost impossible to live, as is the whole Sermon on the Mount when we read it all at one time together. I think we're taking it on this week in Bible study. We need to read and to hear these words not literally, but as a call into the kingdom of heaven. I believe that Jesus was not challenging us to live perfectly, but to live into a life of reconciliation which brings the kingdom of God into reality here on earth. These texts 
are very difficult. So I read commentary by Cheryl Lindsay, and I'm going to use a lot of her words today because I think sometimes you read something and it just says what I'm trying to say because I can't quite clear the cobwebs out. She reflects on how Jesus does this in a series of dualistic statements that we heard read this morning. She reminds us that this passage is situated within the larger context of the Sermon on the Mount in which Jesus presents the reality lived and hoped of the kingdom of God here on earth. And is that not what we all are hoping for as people of faith, to live our faith and experience and to bring the kingdom of heaven here on earth? You see, Jesus introduced his sermon, which I preached a few weeks ago on the Beatitudes, a series of statements reimagining what it means to be blessed by God. <clears throat> Jesus continues with these dualistic statements we heard read this morning with a particular pattern. The first clause begins with, you have heard that it was said, Meaning, and Jesus is referencing the Torah or the law. And the second claw, clause begins with, but I say to you. Now you English teachers are going to enjoy this. It's the but, a conjunction that plays an essential role in, understand, in our understanding of what Jesus means during this teaching. But brings together two independent and equal clauses. They stand on their own. They have a relationship. It's not mutual, affirming, or complementary because in that case, they would be connected with the conjunction and. The word and holds the two clauses together as equals that are both true. But serves a different function, at least in part negates what precedes it by the truth of what follows it. Now I know why I fell asleep in English class occasionally. <laughs> Sorry, all you English teachers. The first statement stands on its own, but it does not enjoy equal status with the second one. The clause that follows maintains a higher position and exerts itself on the words that come before the but. And isn't that what happens when the word, logos, enters into the world? There was experiences with and from God before Jesus, but even the Pharisees and other religious authorities marveled at the authority of which Jesus brought into his teachings, we read in the Gospels. There was always a meaning, means of grace for the lives of the faithful with redemption, with repair and restoration. But Jesus embodied grace and demonstrated miraculous acts of restoration, healing, and wholeness in his ministry. In Jesus, God entered the human condition. The law had been a guide for maintaining right relationship with God, neighbor, and yes, and self. But Jesus reinterprets, reinterprets what had merely become ritual, routine, and fundamental. Kind of like when we say the Lord's Prayer, we say it without thinking about the words, right? We talked about that earlier this week, I think. Right, Sandy? Yes. Warren Carter, sa Carter says, accordingly, the scenes in 521 through verse 48 are not an antithesis where Jesus quotes from the biblical tradition and then abolishes it. Rather, he quotes the passage and interprets it. He instructs disciples to be, reconcile be a reconciled community to curb male lust and power concerning adultery and divorce, 
in a patriarchal society and to speak trustworthy words. It used to be our word was our bond. A handshake sealed the deal. Now we got to hire lawyers and cross the T's and dot the I's. So if somebody doesn't be truthful, we can then take them to court. In other words, be trustworthy. Realize there is not a dominant gender and take your anger and meld it into a world of reconciliation and love. You see, the law served as a means of grace, of reconciliation long before Jesus walked on this earth. The, law, the Levitical law describes the offense, recognizes the real damage caused by the offense, and prescribes a remedy toward repair and restoration. Isn't that what we all want? <laughs> repair and restoration of relationships, of community? When we characterize the biblical narrative as primarily a rule book, rather than a storybook or extended testimonial, we can overlook the relational nature of the law, the importance of building the kingdom of God here and now is through community and building good relationships with each other. The law was introduced to serve relationships rather than the other way around. It is the foremost in the acknowledgement that when we break communal commitments, harm occurs and harm demands repair. Remember what I asked at the very beginning? Those moments of anger where we, get, we did something usually has caused harm to self and to uh, someone else. God's laws are just. And for the benefit of humanity, that does well when boundaries are and expectations are clear. Jesus, in this amazing Sermon on the Mount, exposes the limitations of taking the law on face value alone without reasoning about its deeper and broader application and its meaning. Faithful obedience to the law does not presume perfection, as we sometimes think, but fosters personal and communal introspection on what it means to be a people called to live in relationship with God. That happens in Bible study. That happens in our women's group that met and had a devotion. We had that conversation. We are building on our relationships. It happens when we go to the coffee house after worship and sit at the table and talk with each other, get to know each other better. Hannah Case Winter states the Sermon on the Mount in its clarion call to a radically different way of life does unmask the sinfulness of the life we now live, turned in on ourselves as we are. Indeed, it makes our need for God's grace very clear, but the message also moves and motivates us toward the higher justice to which Jesus calls us. It does so not by giving a set of prescriptions to be followed in a legalistic manner, but rather examples of life oriented by the love of God, the love of neighbor. The living of the law of love is illuminated by the application to a few focal incidences. In every case, the disciple is urged to follow in God's way by doing as God does, Loving without limits. Amen? Amen? Loving without limits. You see, Jesus invites us to live the righteousness of God, to be a holy people. It can seem that holiness and righteousness are impossible and in inaccessible standards. That's when we take the legalistic approach that makes what is intended to be a way of living into a checklist for life an either-or proposition rather than a commitment to becoming a person of faith following Jesus.
Just as faith is not measured by a set of beliefs, but by trust. Righteousness isn't attained by reducing our sin tally to zero, but rather through our connection and relationship to God. We are holy because we are claimed. You like that? We are claimed. God claims us through our baptisms with our name. We are companions of God. You see, Jesus is not calling his disciples then and now to a higher righteousness demonstrated in these illustrations. He does not constitute a set of prescriptions on the one hand, nor does it imply an annulment of the law on the other. What Jesus offers in this text is an interpretive key for understanding the law. It is a radical gift of self to God and to neighbor in both inner thought and outward action. <clears throat> the last line was from Ann Case Winters. The Sermon on the Mount was given to his disciples by Jesus the Christ with a message, but more importantly, more importantly, Jesus was the message. Reconciliation is a way of living, a way of being even despite our anger despite our sinful ways. When we center our relationship in Christ, <clears throat> when we fill ourselves with the gift of grace, the gift of love that fills our lives, the law is fulfilled and flows out into the world through our actions. We can heal and be healed. We can repair and be repaired, we can restore and be restored, we can reconcile and be reconciled. You see, the kingdom of God is here and now in God's call on our lives, in the love that flows out of who we are despite our anger, despite whatever holds us and separates us from the love of God. Because once we say yes, God continues to claim us, continues to call us, continues to pull us into the companionship of the holy. No matter what we do to get in the way, God is there calling, anointing, blessing. So sisters and brothers, we have no other choice but to go and to build the kingdom of heaven in the living of our lives and the filling of our souls with the amazing grace of God's love. Let us go and be those disciples Jesus is calling on the Sermon on the Mount. Amen? Amen. Let us pray.